Hi class, I'm Dr. Donna Fife, and I'm going to go over the midterm review for Advanced Pathophysiology for Walden University, course 6501. First, look over some basic exam information. Um, now, the midterm is going to cover materials from weeks one through six. Uh, the midterm is due in week six by Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. If you're in a different time zone, make sure that you accommodate for the time zone change as the school goes by central time. The exam is gonna cover lecturio videos and some material from the textbook could be included in there as well. You have one attempt to complete the exam. There is no use of notes, books, or any other resources. You have two and a half hours to complete the exam. If you are not done with the exam at that two and a half hour time limit, it will cut off. So be sure you're monitoring the time and ensuring that you have adequate time to complete the exam. Additionally, if you don't complete it by 11.59 p.m. Central Time, it will automatically cut off and you will lose points for all of the questions that were not answered. So be mindful of the time. There's 100 questions on the exam, technically 101, but one of the questions is just about academic integrity um, for the exam. Now, these questions are going to come from a test bank. I can only access so many questions. So some of the topics that I'm covering um, that are on the exam may not be covered in this review. So it's important to make sure that you're reviewing all of the required material for the course. And it's also recommended that you review the recommended material as well. Test questions should probably mostly be all multiple choice. There could be a true or false or select all that apply. Um, in order to ensure that you don't run into any issues <clears throat> when taking the exam, clear the cache and cookies on your computer. Use Google Chrome with the most updated version. Have only the exam window open in the course if, if you need to. Sometimes it uh, adds opens another window for the exam. Those should be the only windows open. If there's more than that open on your computer, it could run into issues. Now, if the exam logs out on you before the time limit is up, it's important to not panic, log back in, and it should have saved everything, and it should resume with the time that you had left when it logged out. Um, so you won't lose any time. Now, if this doesn't happen when you get logged out, contact tech support or contact tech support for any other tech-related issues. It's a good idea to have tech support's number written down on a piece of paper next to your computer or stored in your phone so that way you can easily access that information to contact tech support um, if a, a technical issue should occur. All right, I'm going to do this exam review in two parts. Part one is going to be weeks one through three. So we'll start with weeks one through two here with cells and altered physiology. Okay, now cells. We have um, with cells, we have adaptation which is a reversible response to accommodate both physiologic and pathologic conditions. Now, an example of this is the uterus with pregnancy. We get an increase in the size and number of cells to accommodate a growing fetus. So uterine growth or enlargement during that first trimester, the enlargement is due to hyperplasia, which is caused by stimulation of the myometrium by estrogen. So we have that hormonal influence in that first trimester that's causing hyperplasia. Now in the second and third trimesters, the uterine growth is mainly due to hyperplastic and hypertrophic growth of the muscle fibers to accommodate a growing fetus. Now we could have some cellular injury going on. We could have, this can result from any factor that disrupts cellular structures or deprives the cell of oxygen and essential nutrients. This can be sublethal or reversible, or lethal or irreversible. Examples include ischemic hypoxic, ischemic reperfusion, free radical, immunologic, infectious, intentional, unintentional, and inflammatory. Now, stress from metabolic derangements is linked to intracellular excessive accumulations of carbohydrate, protein, and lipids. And cell death can result from an accu accumulation of calcium, which is termed a pathologic calcification. 
If I sound like I'm a little out of breath, I apologize. In Colorado, in this uh, uh, elevated altitude, does something to the breathing. So please bear with me. Okay, more on cellular injury. We have two main types of cell death, necrosis and apoptosis. Now a third process, autophagy, this occurs during times of cellular stress and is typically triggered by a deficiency of nutrients or growth factors. This involves uh, the eating of cell cytoplasmic vesicles engulf the cytoplasm and organelles and it's considered like a recycling factory. A normal cell turnover metabolism and tissue atrophy are involved with this process, but this is not responsible for protein synthesis. We'll cover a little bit more on that topic a little bit later on. Now necrosis, this is a common type of cell death with severe cell swelling and breakdown of organelles. Apoptosis, this is cellular destruction for elimination of unwanted cell populations. And necroptosis, this is necrosis genetically controlled through a defined molecular pathway, despite the inhibition of apoptotic pathway. And this uh, chart here just gives a little more information on apoptosis, necrosis, and necroptosis. Okay, the cellular organelles, mitochondria, uh, this is the cellular organelle that's primarily responsible for generating energy for cellular functions. So that's where the cells get their energy, through the mitochondria. Now, injury can cause mitochondrial permeability, which leads to the development of a pore, and there's a loss of proton gradient, which affects the ATP. This was covered in the video um, in week one from the lecturio. This slide comes from there as well. Now we have cytochrome C, and this drives the formation of an apoptosome, which is this little thing here, and it activates enzymes that cause apoptosis. And then we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is an organelle in the plasma cell responsible for the synthesis of immunoglobulins. Okay, a little more in cellular adaptation, atrophy decrease in cell size. And this can affect an organ as well. And an example of this is the brain atrophy that occurs in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Now, um, atrophy secondary to chronic malnutrition. This is associated with the topogeny, excuse me, phogeny, I have a hard time saying that word, um, where self-destruction autophagic vacuoles are created within the cell. Hypertrophy is that increase in cell size, and this occurs in response to the mechanical load or stress and results in increased size of the affected organ, like that example we gave with the uterus. Hyperplasia, increase in cell number. Now this results from an increased rate of cellular division and occurs when damage is severe or prolonged or when it results in cell death. This change can be compensatory which enables the uh, organ to regenerate, such as the liver, or it can be hormonal, like we discussed with the uterus during pregnancy, or benign prosthetic hyperplasia in men when there's that overgrowth of the prostate. Now, metaplasia, there's reversible replacement of one differentiated cell by another cell type, and dysplasia is deranged cellular growth, this isn't really considered a true cellular adaptation, but it's an atypical hyperplasia. And this can be seen with something like cervical dysplasia on the cervix of a woman during a pap smear, which that dysplasia can turn into cancer. So it's important to address it. All right, hypoxia and ischemia. Now hypoxia is a lack of sufficient oxygen within the cells and it's the single most common cause of cellular injury. It's a prominent feature of pathological states encountered in bacterial infection, inflammation, wounds, cardiovascular defects, uh, and cancer. Now causes can be a reduced um, oxygen in the ambient air, loss of hemoglobin, decreased red blood cell production, Respiratory and cardiovascular diseases can have this issue and poisoning of cellular oxidative enzymes. 
Now, when there's prolonged hypoxia from severe respiratory conditions, this can cause a decreased intracellular pH. Prolonged hypoxia can lead to a detachment of ribosomes. Now with ischemia, this involves a lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients, and buildup of metabolic wastes. Uh, there's ischemia-induced reduction in ATP levels caused by failure of the sodium-potassium pump and sodium and calcium exchange mechanisms. So we have some changes going on with these electrolytes here. Sodium and calcium can influx into and accumulate in the cell. Potassium diffuses out of the cell and sodium and water can freely enter the cell which results in cellular swelling, which of course is not good. Um, now, when there's ischemia and there is reperfusion established, this can lead to an ischemia reperfusion injury. Restoration of blood flow and oxygen to ischemic tissues can increase recovery of cells that have been reversibly injured. Uh, ischemia reperfusion injury can result and cause cell death as well. Uh, proposed mechanisms for reperfusion injury, oxidative stress, nitrogen-based free radicals, increased intracellular calcium concentration, inflammation, and that complement activation. Uh, chemical or toxic injury can happen to the cells. Now some commonly encountered toxic gases include smoke, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, sulfur dioxide, and chlorine. This is why it's important to know uh, a person's work or occupation to know if they're exposed to these types of toxins. Toxins can cause damage to the airway epithelium and can also promote mucus secretion, inflammation, mucosal edema, ciliary damage, which makes it difficult to cough anything out, pulmonary edema, and surfactant inactivation. Acute toxic inhalation frequently can be calculated by RDS, excuse me, ARDS and pneumonia. Some uh, commonly encountered uh, issues can be coal, such as those working in coal mines, dust of silica, cement, uh, construction workers can get that dust from cement that affects them, talc, people working with fiberglass, and different metals, and these can lead to a pneumoconiosis. Again, this is why it's important to know someone's occupation when we're doing history and physical on them to see if they were exposed to anything like this. These can lead to a restrictive lung disease, silicon, asbestos, um, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Some exposures can cause cancer. An example of that is asbestos causing mesothelioma, mesothelioma which is a bronchogenic lung cancer. Now, acetaminophen, Tylenol, something we give patients, we take ourselves. This can um, become an issue because it can be metabolized into a toxic compound that causes irreversible liver damage. So that seems like a benign drug, but we need to be careful with acetaminophen when we prescribe that for patients, recommend it for patients. Mercury, a cellular component primarily affected, the plasma membrane sulfhydryl groups leading to the sodium potassium ATPase inhibition. Okay, now hypersensitivity reactions. A biphasic reaction, there's exposure to an allergen, and then the, usually the symptoms usually improve, but it can worsen within 12 to 24 hours. So the patient may need to be admitted to the hospital depending on what is going on. Now, a type 1 is an IgE-mediated reaction. Uh, an example of this is anaphylaxis, which, of course, is something very severe, and the patient will need to be monitored closely in the hospital for this. Um, initial exposure produces an antigen-specific IgE. This binds to a mast cell, and subsequent exposures lead to mast cell degranulation, which, again, is a type 1 reaction. Patients may have this happen because of food allergies, legumes such as peanuts, uh, shellfish, 
dairy, eggs, berries, tree nuts, um, medications can cause this, and environmental exposure to items that they're um, sensitive to or allergic to can cause this as well. Treatment, I am epinephrine. That's why you see people with um, allergies to bees or some severe allergy, peanut allergies, having epinephrine with them. Main first line treatment should be that I am epinephrine. Antihistamines can be helpful as well. Patient may need some systemic corticosteroids and maybe have some albuterol for wheezing. Severe cases may require intubation and an epinephrine drip. Okay, uh, type two, this is IgG or IgM, and there's binding of antigen on a target cell. An example of this is rheumatic fever. Type three, there's a circulating antigen antibody complex, which an example of this is serum sickness. And type four is a T cell mediated response. And an example for that is poison ivy. And there's some other examples listed here with these different types of hypersensitivity reactions. Now, an allergic reaction that can occur is urticaria or hives. This is a classic type one reaction. I used to get idiopathic hives when I was in my 20 and it was miserable. Um, there's profoundly itchy. It's stimulated by skin contact. These lesions can come and go. Maybe associated with angioedema, which I had before as well, and it is not much fun. Um, and these can be acute and short-lived. Chronic is when it's considered lasting longer than six weeks. Treatment is with oral antihistamines, usually using the um, less sedating ones, such as Claritin or Loratadine, um, Allegra. Um, H2 antagonists, they covered more information on that in the video for this. Um, they can also help a little bit as well. Now, steroids are not likely to help in this situation. All right, angioedema. This can be um, quite severe in some patients. There's localized swelling. It is an allergic reaction. It can be inherited, such as the hereditary uh, angioma, or it can be medication-induced, uh, such as ACE inhibitors. And I saw a patient this when I was in school that came in with angioedema in the lips, and it was from an ACE inhibitor. This lady has it quite severe here, which of course you see the swelling here. There could be a lot of swelling going on inside um, in the throat as well, which of course can be, you know, a, a emergency situation. So treatment, of course, we're gonna remove the offending agent, treat it as hives. If the airway is involved, they're gonna need close observation in the hospital. And if there's airway obstruction, epinephrine and airway support are required. And again, with anaphylaxis, the first line treatment is an IM epinephrine. All right, here's some stuff that was in from week two. There's uh, atrophy, which is a decrease in cell size and the organ size decreases as well. Um, viable and potentially reversible. Diffuse atrophy in skeletal muscle, we can see that in patients or withdrawal of hormone stimulation can cause this. And cell loss will also lead to organ atrophy, such as the example we said with the brain in a patient with Alzheimer's. Protease, uh, proteasome degradation, there's transfer ubiquitin. Proteasome cat catabolism, there's normal cytosolic protein turnover or cyclins. This may involve ubiquitin targeting and may be increased in hypercatabolic states. Lysosomal catabolism, there's normal cell metabolism. And more on that autoph autophagy, there's normal cell metabolism, normal cell turnover, atrophy and regression, turnover of long-lived proteins and organelles, clear damaged constituents, including protein aggregates, and this prolonged cell survival during starvation, the defense against intracellular pathogens. It's a tumor resistance. Um, there can be tumor resistance to therapy 
and it can be a cell death pathway. And I think the video and lectorial co covered a lot more information on this topic. So be sure re you're reviewing that. Okay, now week three is on concepts of cardiovascular disorders. So first we'll look at some basic changes that are going on. Cardiac pathology. There can be pump failure. We can see this with ischemic heart disease, thrombosis to the coronary artery, myocardial infarction, or myocarditis. Now an echo may show a decreased left ventricular motion and ejection fraction, but have normal valve function when it's just a pump failure issue. Low obstruction can occur with a stenotic valve. Regurgitant flow, there's that backward regurgitant flow of blood. Um, shunted flow, extra volume and pressure causes overload. An example of this is a ventral, ventricular septal defect. Disorders of cardiac uh, conduction, AFib and VFib examples there and a rupture of the heart or major vessel, such as a dissecting aneurysm. Okay, let's talk about some hypertension. Uh, consistent elevation of systemic arterial blood pressure, and this is from the uh, small um, arteries that this is happening. And to find a sustained systolic blood pressure of 130 or more and diastolic of 80 or more. Now, primary hypertension, the cause is unknown, but there can be genetics, environmental, neurohormonal effects that influence the intravascular volume and PVR. Secondary hypertension, this is attributed to a specific cause, such as renal disease or an endocrine disorder. Um, angiotensin II, this has a role in hypertension. There's upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system activity, increased release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, and enhancement of antidiuretic hormone secretion, or ADH. Atherosclerosis, this is thickening of the and hardening of the vessel wall. And there's an accumulation of lipid-laden macrophages within the arterial wall which leads to a formation of plaque. And this is showing a little example of that there. We see this with coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, and cerebrovascular diseases. There's a fibrofatty plaque, which is a, uh, there's a thickening of the endothelial layer, and there's development of scar tissue. And this has a necrotic core with dead cells that often contain lipid crystals. Atherosclerosis can be um, defined as mild, moderate, and severe. When a patient has a cardiac cath and they're looking at the heart um, arteries, that proximal left anterior descending artery, um, about 77, or excuse me, about 70% stenosis is considered critical when they find um, that blockage in that artery. Okay, dysrhythmia is a disturbance of the heart rhythm. Now, normal heart rhythms are generated by the SA node in the heart. There are disorders that can affect conduction, inherited abnormalities, ischemia, infection, underlying disease, medications, or an iatrogenic injury. There's changes in the pulse rate and also the cardiac output and blood pressure. Now, AFib, that's a common one seen um, risks for that include hypertension, ischemia, cardiomyopathy, valve disease, hyperthyroidism, medications might cause it, alcohol and drugs, or inherited conduction abnormalities. Symptoms can have palpitations, lightheadedness, anxiety, dyspnea, chest pain, and syncope. Complications, something we need to really be concerned about is this um, AFib can cause a stroke or a CVA, and that's from a thrombus or emboli from the left atrium. You see here in this left atrium, you get these EDs of blood flow that provides a, an environment conducive to a clot forming, and then it goes out from there into the body and can cause a stroke. 
Okay, aortic stenosis. This is the most commonly diagnosed form of valvular heart disease. Three common causes, congenital bicuspid valve, degeneration with aging, or inflammatory damage due to rheumatic heart disease. There's calcific aortic stenosis, and the pressure gradient across the valve increases as the aortic valve becomes more calcified. I think that was discussed pretty well in the um, Lecturio video. So make sure you're re-reviewing -re that material. And the bicuspid versus tricuspid aortic valves as well. Patients with bicuspid aortic valves tend to develop calcific aortic stenosis at a younger age. Aortic dissection, uh, the media becomes weakened and there's rupture or separation of the media. This is considered a surgical emergency. Etiology, most common cause is hypertension. 70% uh, of the affected individuals with aortic dissection is due to hypertension. Other causes, atherosclerosis, connective tissue disorders, inflammatory disorders such as vasculitis, anatomic abnormalities, trauma, cardiac catheterization can cause this, and drugs such as amphetamines and cocaine. Now with trauma, this might happen with a rapid deceleration trauma, uh, such as with a vehicle collision. And the dissection in this case is most likely to occur at the descending thoracic aorta adjacent to the ligamentum arteriosum, distal to the great vessels. Heart failure, there's a decreased myocardial contractile function for normal cardiac output, and there's some compensatory mechanisms. Cardiac myocardial hypertrophy, the heart enlarges. Cardiac ventricular dilation, or both of these might be occurring as compensatory mechanisms. Tachycardia can occur due to activation of the neurohormonal system, the sympathetic nervous system. There's a release of norepinephrine and atrial naturopathic peptide, an activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's important to know a little bit about Starling's law, the rubber band law of the heart. The more you fill it, the more it will contract. Increased contraction results by increasing the length of sarcomeres in a dilated heart. And this increases myocardial contractility and thereby attempts to maintain the stroke volume of the heart. Ischemic heart disease, um, symptoms there, dyspnea, palpitations, dizziness, restlessness, anxiety. Autonomic symptoms, patient may have diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, posterior wall ischemia, or activating the vagal nerve, syncope and bradycardia. Now we have the Glagov phenomenon of vascular remodeling. This was covered in the lectorial video as well. The lumen size doesn't change and the blood flow remains the same, even though there is more atherosclerotic plaque. And this is due to an outward remodeling of the vessels, so it accommodates. But at about 70% stenosis, the ability of that vessel wall to expand is inadequate to keep up, and that's when the patient may become symptomatic. Infective endocarditis. Pathogenesis here is an infection, it can be from a dental or surgical procedure, there can be trivial breaks in the epithelial barrier, or it can be seen with IV drug abuse as well. Microorganisms enter the bloodstream, um, susceptible valve, and leads to endocarditis. So it affects the susceptible valve there. And the hallmarks are vegetations and valvular destruction. They're just showing some little vegetations on there, so um, we can have some issues with those. Now, the Duke criteria, this was covered some in the Lecturio video. Major um, positive blood cultures of a typical microorganism indicative of infective endocarditis and two separate blood cultures. Um, also an echo showing valve-related mass or abscess is a major criteria and new valvular regurgitation. Some minor criteria, 
There's predisposing heart lesion there, IV drug abuse, fever, vascular lesions, immunological phenomenon, and microbiological evidence. Now, embolic complications can occur because of those vegetations on the valve. They can become dislodged um, and end up becoming a particulate embolus, which can you know, lead to some damage, uh, stroke or something of that sort. Okay, myocardial infarction, a localized area of necrotic tissue in the heart caused by occlusion that cuts off supply of oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. Now, the faster blood flow can be restored, the better the chance the patient has of minimizing irreversible death to the cardiac cells. So it's very important for this to be addressed right away. Tissue begins to infarct in about 20 minutes after that artery is blocked. Tissue can be salvaged if the blood flow is restored within four hours of the blockage. And I covered some of this information in the lectorial video as well. Um, if it's affecting the left circumflex artery, can be a lateral, it will be a lateral or posterior MI. The left anterior descending um, causes anterior wall damage. This one's known as the widow maker um, as it has a high rate of mortality. And the right coronary artery um, is seen with, uh, there's inferior wall damage occurring. Sorry, I have people upstairs from me making a lot of noise, so it's a little distracting to me right now. I apologize. Okay, varicose veins. Um, now, veins, these are um, factors affecting the venous return. We have intrinsic factors, and some of those are venous gradient, valve integrity, musculovenous pump, abdominothoracic pump, cardiac pump, and sympathetic tone. Those are all uh, intrinsic factors leading to varicose veins. Extrinsic factors, things happening outside of the body, gravity, uh, atmospheric pressure, and external compression on areas. All right, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Generally, this is happening in the deep veins of the legs. Can also occur in the periprosthetic venous plexus in men, and the pelvic venous plexus in women, and the large veins in the skull. Risks being male, over 50 years of age, congestive heart failure, prolonged immobilization, pregnancy, obesity, oral contraceptives, malignancy, or hereditary coagulopathies such as factor V leading. Clinical manifestations, distal edema. Generally, that's going to be unilateral if the clot is just on one side. Cyanosis, superficial vein dilation, heat, redness, swelling, tenderness, pain, but many patients are asymptomatic. Complications, this vein, excuse me, this uh, thrombus can dislodge from the vein and become a pulmonary embolus as it travels up to the pulmonary system and ends up in the pulmonary artery in which the patient would have an acute onset of dyspnea. And of course, this can be fatal. We do have plasmin and this helps break down fibrin, which facilitates resolution of the clot. All right, final slide on this uh, part, mechanisms of hemostasis, usually extrinsic cascade that drives coagulation. So arrest of bleeding by formation of blood clots at the site of vascular injury. Now there's three interactive components, the vasculature, which is the endothelial cells and subendothelial matrix, platelets and clotting factors. Endothelial cells contain intracellular structures that contain von Wildebrand factor, which is clotting factor eight, which is released during vascular injury and activates platelets for hemostasis. Platelets, there's induction of vasoconstriction. They initiate adhesion and aggregation and form a platelet plug, like this here. There's activation of the coagulation cascade, um, and that's initiate the repair process. There's clot retraction and clot dissolution and fibrinolysis that goes on here. 
Now, clotting factors, important to note, that are cleaved by thrombin are factors 5, 8, 9, and 13. Excuse me, 11 and, 11 and 13. I think I got that one wrong. Okay, but that's covered in the lecturio video. Again, I'm sorry I'm distracted by the people and the dogs above me that are making a lot of noise. Uh, make sure you understand uh, a lot of the basics of structure and function of the um, cardiovascular system to help in preparation for this exam. And I'll be back with part two in just a minute. Thank you and have a great day.